before we get started, uh, just to, just as a question, the the for some reason I walked in the room is set to 78 degrees. Would you mind if I turned it down a little bit? Don't do that. Well, I'm doing it. I'm setting it to 72. So, uh, all right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, 72. Quite Arctic weather. All right. Let's get started. Um, I'm actually going to enter. There was a question right before class I, I thought that was, was kind of interesting about um, new. Uh, there's a new Dodge pickup truck that's coming out that uh, I guess there is a setting where you can, uh, the hydraulics will lower the truck so that it will fit into parking garages. Um, so parking garages, as you know, are, are, they tend to get made with reinforced concrete quite a bit and a lot of precast elements. A lot, a lot of pre, uh, a lot of parking garages tend to have very cookie cutter design and tend to be, um, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's a lot of pre-built and pre-manufactured stuff. So, um, you know, the, it's one of those things like where somebody said, you know, why are parking garages always low? Well, they're they're always the same, you know, because they're they're uh, they're very pre uh, pre-designed and pre-manufactured type of systems, but. Um, uh, an interesting and then a story about this. Um, a lot of times in uh, large-scale structural engineering projects, one of the things that you really want to do is create a superstructure that is as shallow as possible. Like, like for instance, let's take Washington D.C. Okay, there is an ordinance in Washington D.C. that buildings can only be so tall. In other words, it, specifically, they can't be taller than something in Washington, D.C. And what is that? The monument. You can't, you can't have a building taller than the monument. So the idea is to have a floor superstructure that is as shallow as possible. Now, it might not seem like a lot, but if you can take uh, floor beams or a floor system and make it, you know, five inches shallower or six inches shallower, yeah, it might not seem like a big deal, but imagine a 30-story building take that six inches and add it up, you can get an entire another story of that building. Another story means more real estate, means more real estate that you can rent out and sell, means more money for the developer. So like flat slab construction is actually very common in Washington, D.C. because of that very notion. You can get a very shallow system. I mean, the structure gets a little complicated and it can get a little expensive, but in the end, the economics work out. And um, uh, now, now that, that has nothing to do with this story. So, um, uh, for those of you that are in ASCE, you know we have our, our annual uh, Virginia's conference, and the, and the regional conference is where the canoe and the bridges. It hops around from year to year, and this year we are again going to D.C. Uh, one of the D.C. schools is, is hosting the, the, the conference. It's kind of funny. Last time we were in D.C., one of the other schools, they, um, they brought a uh, 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 one of the, 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 the you know, 15 passenger vans to bring the, the students to the conference. And when they went to the parking garage, they, could, they couldn't get the parking, the van in the parking garage. They started letting the air out of the tires to get, <laughs> to get the van in the garage. <laughs> that was hilarious. I'm sorry, I thought that was funny. Okay. <laughs> Had nothing to do with anything, but okay. Let's get back into the realm of concrete. So uh, homework three, y'all have a homework due on Monday. Um, do y'all have any questions about it? It's a short, I mean, it really is a short homework assignment. I think those of you that have started it are, are pretty much knocked it out or knocked the main chunk of it out. Ha has everybody s taken a look at it? I hope you have. Hey, it's due Monday. That's on y'all. <laughs> um, okay, all right, all right. A right. couple things. Um, I did want to sort of close out what we did on example six. This was our beam design example, and the one thing we didn't have time to finish was the ACI minimum reinforcement check, but it, it ends up not really being that big of a deal. Remember, this right here, this is your formula for ACI minimum reinforcement, and when you plug and chug, remember we got a beam that was 14 inches wide and the depth was, uh, the effective depth was 21 inches. When you plug and chug, you get a, a, a minimum steel requirement of about .98 square inches. But if you recall, the, the reinforcement selection that we picked, I mean, this was, this was you know, above and beyond that. So we, we met that requirement and so. So the ACI minimum check was really, not, uh, was really not that big of a deal. 
Um, does anybody have any questions on that? Yes. The what? No, no, no. This is this is what this is saying is this is the minimum amount of steel you must have in the beam. Period. Okay. This isn't the minimum uh, requirement per bar. This is the minimum requirement for the whole beam. That's a good question. All right. Any any other questions? Now I, I wanted to pull something up before we get into our. Uh, known cross-section design because if you unknown cross-section design is actually a lot more complicated uh, when you know what the cross-section looks like the designs actually a lot simpler because the number of variables gets reduced uh, quite a bit um, but I did want to pull this up um, let me show you what I've got here um, so what I have here is a, a little spreadsheet that I wrote and, and what this spreadsheet has is a uh, it's basically framed all around everything that was going on in example six. Remember example six was a beam that was 22 foot long. It had a superimposed dead load of one kip per foot and a uh, superimposed live load of two kips per foot that was already reduced. Now if you look in these five boxes up top, these five boxes contain the data that essentially defines what the beam looks like. There's the FC prime and the FY. There's the, uh, the width, the depth, and the area of steel. Okay, that was our design. Okay, and I want to show you a couple things because I think it's kind of nifty to actually see the impact of, of some of these variables uh, as you go through and, and, uh, and, and start to iterate. Let's put this over here. So, so what I did is I basically just copy and pasted the same thing over. Now I, I want to walk you through this spreadsheet so that you, you kind of see what's going on. Um, for instance, if you start looking at the formula bar up top, these values aren't static. I mean, they are updating accordingly. Like, for instance, if I take the beam and I make it, let's say, instead of 14 inches, let's say I make it 44 inches wide. Okay, that updates the self-weight and that updates the distributed load and, and all of that. So, so the, 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 the beam is, um, is being, or the shape of the, uh, the cross-section is being updated accordingly. So let's go 14. In fact, let me, let me also make this a little more uh, fluid. I'm just going to say 14 and 21, just to allow us a little more fluidity. Okay. So a, a couple other things worth mentioning. So um, over here on the, the right of these numbers, there are three checks that are being done. So one of them is the HCI minimum steel check. So if you look at this formula bar, basically that's what was on the slide that you just saw, the BD over FY times the maximum of either 3 squared of FC prime or 200 and so on and so forth. And basically what this is saying is, you know, if I, if I take this and I make it like 0.5, well that's less than the, um, than the, that's less than the minimum steel, so it says no good. But obviously that wouldn't, you wouldn't have enough capacity in the beam, so you wouldn't have a, a, a capacity or adequate enough capacity either, so 3.82. Okay, so it's computing the height, it's computing the self weight, it's computing the factored load and the factored moment. It's computing the depth of the stress block. I even have it uh, so that it'll alter the value of beta 1. So if, if I make FC prime 5 or 6 or 7 or 8, it'll, it'll update that. The depth of the neutral axis, the strain. This is checking whether or not the strain is greater than or equal to 0.004. Remember, that's the minimum strain limit. It's computing your phi value and phi mn. Now this, uh, over here on the left, this is what we got at the end of our example. We had a factored bending moment of about 291.6 foot kips. That's what we were putting on the beam, and the beam can withstand 319.6. So it's good, and if you divide those two, you get an efficiency of about 91.2%. What I want to do is I want to show you some of the influence. What happens if you actually start playing around with these numbers? That's why Excel is kind of kind of nice for this. Like, like, for instance, one of the things I said is, what happens if you double FC prime? So what I'm going to do here, over here on the right, let's take FC prime and let's make it 8. Okay? So I've doubled the compressive strength of the concrete. But look what that did. It really didn't do much in the long run. We went from a capacity of 319.6 to 340.3. That really didn't do that much. You know, you'd think man, I doubled the capacity of the concrete. You'd think that would have a broad impact on the, on the design. Not really. It really doesn't. Um, because, you know, you, you got to think of it like this. You, you know, you have this massive concrete beam that's providing this compressive force. 
But to match that, you've got, what, three number 10 bars? These really, really tiny bars. Those tiny bars have a lot of capacity. So the influence uh, of, of those, uh, those bars, they, they have a little bit more of an oomph to, to what's going on. So uh, a couple other things that are worth mentioning. Uh, let's see. So one of the things that you will find is that if you change, if you, if you have a design, and let's say that design is no good, and you need to beef up that design, okay? Let me ask you a question. Let's say we were looking at the dimensions of the concrete beam. What do you think is going to influence the capacity of the concrete beam more? Changing the width or changing the depth? The depth. The depth is going to beef up your capacity uh, a lot more. See, for instance, if I, if I have this, this beam, let's say I double the width. So let's say I make this 28. All it did, it beefed it up maybe, you know, 20 foot kips or something. But if I go back and I say, okay, let's make this 42. Boom. Bumped it up quite a bit. I mean, how are you getting, mo I mean, what's the fundamental definition of moment? Force times distance. That D it contributes to the moment arm more than the width does. So it's something you need to be aware of. Now, now it's a trade-off because the deeper you make the beam, I mean, imagine if the ceiling got lower, you know. Sometimes you don't have much room. So uh, you may have to make the beam wider. You may have to throw more beams in there. So it, it, you, you got to sort of be aware of all the different uh, impacts. Now, this, this is also something that's kind of interesting. By and large, one of the easiest ways to influence the capacity of your cross-section is to beef up the, the steel, to add more steel to it. So, so watch what happens. Let's take this 3.82 and let's add, let's, let's fictitiously say we added about another bar to it and made it like 4.5. Now, I, that's just one more piece of rebar, theoretically, and we're, we're definitely bumping up that capacity quite a bit. Now, I, I want to show you something. This is kind of nifty. Watch this. Okay? Let's say we have something like 5.5 .5 square inches, okay? Now watch this. This is phi mn, okay? Okay, so phi mn is about what, 422.6? Okay, now I got 5.5 .5 square inches. Watch what happens when I change that to 6. Look what happened to the capacity. It really didn't change very much, okay? But if I go back, so what did I do? I added another half a square inch. Let's go back to our original design. So 3.82, and let's add a half a square inch to that, so that'd be like, what, 4.32? That bumped up quite a bit. Why did, the, did adding steel in this range, why did it have more of an impact here than it did on that higher range of steel? Pay attention to your fee value. So watch what happens when I have 5.5, so fee is 0.876. Now what happens, now watch what happens to fee when I change this to 6. So yeah, your nominal moment capacity goes up, but your fee goes down, okay? So what happens is the more and more steel that you throw in there, the concrete's got to match that. You know, compression's got to equal tension. What ends up happening is the more and more steel that you throw into the section, the less strain that you get in that steel. So sometimes just throwing a bunch of steel into the, into the beam, you're literally wasting money. Like, for instance, you know, going from 5.5 to 6, I, there's really no benefit at all. So you're just, I mean, you know, folks, say, well, it'd make me feel better. Well, fine, but you're wasting money. So it's something to think about. Okay? Any other questions? Yes? No. No, th this one, honestly, this is one that, that it would, you ought to try and build yourself. Um, it would help you understand the math more, and it would, um, I mean, I mean, you all have computers in Excel. There's nothing stopping you from stopping you from building this. Um, if anything, it would make your design calcs and homeworks easier. And I don't have a problem with that. So, I mean, you can't use it on an exam. So. Oh, you could absolutely. Yeah, you could say you could say uh, um, like 3.82. You could go in and say something like uh, data. Um, what if analysis, and you could say, all right, set that equal to one by changing this, and, you know, get that. So, yeah, you can do that, but there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, and if you can find a pattern of reinforcement that works that way, you can go for it. That, and that, that is a very 
real uh, means of taking a design in the real world and, and increasing its efficiency a little bit. Nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, I don't need you all to do that for, for homeworks or anything like that, but you're exactly right. I mean, very possible. Yes? I'm not saying not to. I'm, go ahead. Yeah. But in order to do that, you need to build a spreadsheet. You got your laptop, get going. What? Well, there's the test, and then there's actually doing reinforced concrete design. And, and let me say this. Building the spreadsheet will help you understand the method. I'm, I'm serious. I mean, you'll understand the equations. You'll understand the procedures because you'll be thinking about them in a different way. So, Right. That, that's a good question. Uh, the question was how to get the fee to change. It's right here. So it, it's a little involved, but basically what I'm saying is if the strain is greater than or equal to 0 0.005, it's 0.9, or it's the maximum of 0.65 or that line. So y'all know this is recording, right? So, so yeah. Does that, does that make sense? Anybody have any questions on this stuff? And is everybody good on example six? Okay, all right. Okay, um, what I want to do now is I want to, um, I want to take this concept of designing a beam and, and I want to sort of, it, it, to expand that, that process would actually be sort of the wrong state or wrong way of putting it. If anything, I'm contracting it. Because what we did before is we were looking at designing a beam with what we're calling an unknown cross-section. And what I mean by that is we're designing a beam and we don't have a clue what the beam looks like at all. Okay? And that's what we just did in example six. You know, we designed a reinforced concrete beam with no information whatsoever other than some blanket assumptions on the material properties, which you just saw. I mean, FC prime uh, really doesn't affect the, the design of a beam that much. And FY, I mean, grade 60 steel is incredibly common. So those are very common values to assume uh, at step one. Um, but the, the main thing or the main concept behind that, that design effort was we needed to determine the dimensions of the beam and the required amount of steel that went into that beam. Um, now, that's for an unknown cross-section. For a known cross-section, we know what the beam looks like. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is determine the area of steel. We know what we know the cross section. We know what the steel looks like. And there are very, there are two very common reasons why understanding how to design a beam with a known cross section uh, is, is important. Okay. First reason is that a lot of times in reinforced concrete, we use a lot of precast elements, a lot of elements where the shape is already defined, and all we need to do is figure out the reinforcement. That, that's very common. Uh, in reinforced concrete. So that's one very common reason why we need to know how to design with a known cross-section. That, that's number one. But number two, when you actually start digging into the math, the design of a slab and the design of a known cross-section are basically the same thing, okay? Um, because when we, when we are designing a uh, slab, you know, the element between the beams, well, we take the thickness based off of minimum requirements so we know how deep it is, and as for the width, we assume that slabs basically extend, like they have sort of an infinite width. And what we do is we design sort of a 12-inch strip of slab, and whatever reinforcement we get in that strip, we just assume that's re, uh, repeated throughout the remainder of the slab. So if you know how wide it is, you know how deep it is, you know what the cross-section looks like. So design of a known cross-section, is it's actually an incredibly important uh, exercise. And, and the actual the iteration is pretty much gone because there's only one variable that we need to solve for, and that's the steel. There's only one. So here, here's how we're going to go about this. Uh, and this is, and I want everybody to pay attention to this because this is where students can get a little confused. Okay? Remember the, what was the row value that we used in that last example design? What was that row value that we used? Anybody remember how, how we, what we do there? What was the formula that we used to, for row? The 0 .8, once, uh, 0 0.8 FC prime over FY. Now, why did we use that? Well, we used it because we didn't have a clue what the beam looked like, and that's a nice rule of thumb to make our lives a little easier in the design phase. That's not the case here. 
with a known cross-section. Let's go back to this, this equation. If you all remember this, we took this equation uh, when we were developing our expression for uh, an unknown cross-section. and What we solved for was BD squared, right? Because look at what we have here. We have an expression that says the moment capacity equals the following. It equals material function of material parameters, rho, and BD squared. Well, in, in this scenario, things are a little different because now we know what the material parameters are and we know what BD squared is. So instead of assuming some random value of rho to make our lives a little easier and then solve for BD squared, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that equation and I'm going to solve for rho. Okay? So let's just take this equation and solve for rho. Let's do a little bit of algebra. So take this, divide over here, so mn divided by this chunk outside the parentheses, FYBD squared, equals this, okay? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get everything all over to one side uh, and take a look at this expression. I don't know about you, but if I'm looking at rho, this looks a whole lot like a quadratic equation, right? Because i got a pile of junk times rho squared plus a pile of junk times rho plus a pile of junk equals zero. So that, that's a quadratic equation. So a, you know, a, it was ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. So a would be this fy div, uh, divided by 1.7 fc prime. b would be minus one, and c would be this fraction over here. Y'all okay with that, right? So it's just, you know, quadratic equation. So we've got a quadratic expression. Use the quadratic formula, you know, negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac over 2a. It's kind of weird because I almost don't like using that expression in this class, you know, the quadratic equation, because every, you know, negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac, like all those letters have meanings in this class. Like b is the beam width, a is the depth of the stress block, and c is the neutral axis. I don't like confusing everything, but I think it's common enough that, that you, would, uh, you would understand. So we use the quadratic, uh, quadratic equation. Uh, using that e expression, you know how you have a plus or minus? So when we solved for neutral axes a little while ago, remember we used the quadratic formula and then like one answer was negative and it didn't make any sense. Well, it wouldn't make any sense to have a negative reinforcement ratio either. So this is basically taking this, doing the quadratic equation, simplifying your algebra, and only taking one solution that yields a positive value. So plug and chug and blah, blah, blah. There you go. All right. Make sense? So one thing about this expression um, there is, this is not a typo. I have 1 minus the square root of 1 minus, that's not a typo, that's, that's supposed to be there twice, okay, the 1 minus and the 1 minus. So, don't, don't forget that. <coughs> Sound good? Alright, so, I know students like step-by-step -step processes, here's step-by-step -step process. So, step one in the design of a beam with a known cross-section is always to compute the MU, the factored moments. But I, I want to read this bullet here because I think this is really important. If the cross-section is known, if you know what the beam looks like, then the self-weight of the beam is not assumed. Remember, remember that? Remember we had to assume a beam self-weight in the last example because we didn't have a clue what the beam looks like. We're not doing that here because we, we, the beam's right there. So that's an assumption we do not have to make. There is one assumption we do have to make, though, at the beginning, and that's phi. We have to assume that phi equals 0.9. All right? So once we have mu, we determine uh, our mn required, just mu over phi, and then we compute rho. We are not using that 0.18 fc prime over fy because we're not guessing a rho value for, for design purposes. We're taking these dimensions and we're saying, all right, that's the rho value that we need to meet the requirements for those uh, dimensions. If you recall, um, I mentioned this in our last example, I said, you know, we guessed a rho value, we got some B and D dimensions, and if you remember I said, we could take these B and uh, D dimensions and sort of update and get a more uh, accurate rho value, this would be the equation that you use. It's a little bit too much work and not totally necessary for an unknown cross-section design, but if you're a stickler and, and a purist in terms of the math, uh, you could use it. But, okay, so determine MU, determine MN, get your rho value, AS equals rho BD, Choose a reinforcement pattern that makes sense. Exact same process as we did where we were going through the iterations of bar multiples and figuring out whether or not it fits within the beam. And then analyze your trial section to verify the assumption. Specifically, phi mn greater than or equal to, uh, to mu. And, and also your strain and 
uh, uh, minimum area of steel requirements, et cetera. Any questions? That, that's basically it for a known cross section. It's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, if you understand that, then let, let's take a look at this. Bless you. All right. So this is example seven. I want to design this beam, but when you're designing for a known cross section, you're basically just designing uh, to determine the required area of steel. So let's select a reinforcement pattern for this beam. And to simplify the example a little bit, I, let's just design for a factored moment of 160 foot kip. So we'll assume that all the loads and self weights and all that stuff is taken into account with that bending moment. So we'll design for an MU of 160 foot kips. We're only uh, determining AS. That's all we need to determine. So FC prime, we'll take FC prime to be 3 KSI. Um, uh, B is 16, D is 21. And so I've got this sort of like oval shape here. I, I need to put some reinforcement in there. I don't know what it is. So. All right. So. Oh, oh no. You got to be kidding me. Curse you, smart notebook. What's that? What's that? What? No, no. What's that? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to close this, and we'll save it. We're going to close this. We're going to close this. We're going to go ahead. We'll, we'll save that. We're going to close this. We're going to close this. We're not going to save that. We're going to stop the video. Yeah, hit that subscribe button. All right. 